I've just landed in Honduras on a very important mission to meet the communities most impacted by climate change. And what a beautiful landing. It's hot, it's sunny, and we've just landed between the mountains, and I can't wait to meet the families. Hola. I, I told them I'm never leaving, you know? I have the family, I have the food, so I'm at home, no? Here at the community garden, which is a garden that feeds the entire community. This is my first time cutting a cabbage in Honduras. So we are about to see some beautiful traditional dancing and there are girls wearing these gorgeous long skirts that are paneled in color with green and purple and red and yellow. I mean, this is just so incredible. I'm seeing goats, there's a goat. <laughs> I'm seeing goats, I'm in these beautiful mountains and I'm seeing food stalls along the road selling bananas and fresh produce. It's, it's really wonderful. Welcome to Better Food, Better World. I'm Elizabeth Yamayaro, and in this episode, I have traveled to one of the front lines of climate change, Honduras. Why is it a front line of climate change? Well, in November 2020, there were two devastating hurricanes that destroyed thousands of hectares of staple food and cash crops in this region, destroying livelihoods and undermining people's ability to feed themselves. There's an important conversation happening right now in the region. One minute, the communities are facing severe droughts, and then the next minute is devastating floods. So I hope that you will come with me on this journey because this is not a doom and gloom conversation. Yes, climate change is quite a heavy topic, but we are going to be sharing incredible stories of hope and inspiration, as well as solutions emerging from these communities. But first, I want to tell you about why we're here in Honduras. This country is part of the Dry Corridor, which is a tropical dry forest region on the Pacific coast of Central America, which has been severely impacted by climate change. Welcome to Honduras. I feel right at home in Honduras. I'm excited to speak to Carlos Rodriguez, who is a food and nutrition expert with the Honduran government, working closely with communities most impacted by climate change. We are in the middle of the dry corridor, and Honduras is part of that region. Could you just tell me how climate change has impacted communities in Honduras over the past 10 years? Honduras has been on the top climate change affected countries, according to German Watch, for the past decade. Uh, recurring droughts and the frequency and intensity of natural disasters in Honduras, such as floods, mudslides, tropical storms, hurricanes, and other climate change related impacts, such as the coffee rust, bark beetle, and epidemics, has been putting a strain on. Uh, on poverty alleviation uh, policies and a negative effect in the livelihoods of people, especially in the dry corridor, causing lower food production, heavy soil degradation, and therefore causing a lot of people to choose to migrate to the US or Mexico or other countries, or to uh, urban areas within Honduras, putting a strain on employment. And also it's been causing a severe problem on the generational renewal in the low-scale farming communities, where we see older and older farmers, men and women, still producing foods for their families and communities. What I was able to witness is how the World Food Program in Honduras has helped communities tackle climate change and improve their food production so that it lasts longer, so that people have better access to water supplies from reservoirs, which therefore means that their food won't be as much affected by the drought and the intense rain. The communities are building these incredible greenhouses 
to protect their crops from bugs that would normally destroy their food. I'm going to take you to these places and introduce you to the people directly impacted. You're going to hear my voice muffled just because I'm being super careful like everyone else in Honduras. We are in the midst of the COVID pandemic. We are all having to wear our masks. I'm also excited to introduce you to my colleague, Raul Badelas. He is a WFP program officer who's going to be translating for me. And this is the potato? Yes. We have the potato. Yeah. And they have what they call here like a Maya house. Is it like a greenhouse? Uh, like some a green sort of type of greenhouse, yes. Yeah. We are in this amazing greenhouse where they are growing potatoes, which is one of their most valuable products in this region. And they also not only use it to feed their families, but it's also a way of their livelihood because they sell the potatoes to nearby communities who are not able to produce their own food. Do I dig it or do I pull it? Okay. So I'm digging out a potato. Wow, this is incredible. I've literally just dug up potatoes fresh from the ground and just one stem is given me. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight potatoes. I'm on my way right now to one of the communities that WFP here in Honduras is supporting to adapt to the threats of climate change. And outside the car, we're in this really mountainous region, and I can see there are trees on both sides. There's also vegetable markets along the road, some kids playing in one of the yards. And sitting next to me is a very important man who I'm excited to speak to. His name is Etienne, and he is our deputy country director for the World Food Program here on Honduras. And I'm excited to learn from him what they are doing. So Etienne, it's so lovely to be here with you, and thank you for having me in your country. It's a pleasure to have you, Elizabeth. So, how are communities protecting themselves against climate change? They are building very simple greenhouses, but with the aim to keep all the plagues away from the crops. So it's small spaces, but they can multiply the number of greenhouses. And inside, they can grow vegetables, which are a bit more sensitive to illnesses or bugs. But because they grow them in the greenhouse they are safe from the bugs. So, for instance, we are in a greenhouse where they have right now potatoes and they will harvest in less than 10 days. The cost of the greenhouse is estimated, converted to dollars, to something like $3,000 to build the greenhouse. And just the first harvest, if it's good, but apparently from what we saw right now, it will be good should create an income of $2,500. So with just one harvest, they pay for the greenhouse. So the investment is really, really rentable. Now we are standing outside of the greenhouse and this is the water reservoir that literally nourishes all the plants within the greenhouse. And what's remarkable about it is that it's literally just all organic. The water is coming uh, upstream into the reservoir and they have a filtration system that is just all manually operated. And it's incredible that they can actually grow their own food in a sustainable way at very minimum cost. Here it's a region where usually they grow only two or three types of crops. uh, Maize, beans and another kind of cereal which is extremely dependent on rainfalls. So if the rains are late or if the rains are early, the crops fail. Now, with the diversification of crops, you're not dependent only on two or three types. And because diversifying the crops, you have more possibilities and you can adjust to the season, you can adjust to everything. And on top of it, an irrigation system, which was not 
there before. I mean, most of the, 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 the crops here are depending on the rainfall, the natural one. So with the project, teaching people with very simple systems, nothing mechanic, no pumps, no nothing, everything by gravity. You saw where we are, it's the mountain, so it's easy to have a, an irrigation system by gravity. And then drop irrigation system. And then done, because crops cannot be without water, and then you have a good result. We should hold one for her, and then we should work together, me and her with her. Okay. Because she's going in, huh? Yes. Okay. I'm going to take this one, or do you want her to take yeah, it? Yeah, I think it would be nice for the two of us to walk. Ah, okay. Other, ah, que vaya usted con él, dice, para que las puedan tomar. Yes. So, we can go, go to the market. <laughs> we are at a farmer's market. I'm speaking to Edith Sanchez, who's one of the community leaders, and she has brought in their vegetables that they farm as part of a community to the market to sell them. And I'm talking to her about the devastating impact of climate change onto your community. Bueno, cuando cuando yo hablo de cambio climático es before ejemplo, they were they growing their crops maíz. in May. Right and now they are not doing it that way because now with the climate change they don't know what is going to happen and when it's going to rain. Yeah. Right now, for example, they are starting to grow their crops in April. Sometimes all the growing of their crops has been delayed because it's not like years before, because they knew when it was going to rain, mm. they could get prepared. They knew when winter was coming, they know when summer was coming, and now they have to be analyzing based on all these changes, when it's going to rain, when it's not, to know when they have to grow their crops. Mm. Their livelihood as well, which is why we're at a market selling the produce that they've created so that they can send their children to school and buy other things that they may need and buy the next crops for themselves as well. So it's such an important aspect of food systems, right? That it is a system. It's not just about producing the food, but it's also making sure that once you produce the food, you can actually bring it to a place where you can sell it. And this is what Idris is doing today. And I'm just so incredibly proud of her and the community and inspired to be part of this. And it's just wonderful to see, you know, how people are resilient against all odds. So this is the sound of a freshly picked green pepper, which I'm now munching in my mouth. And it's just really juicy. It's fresh. It's the best pepper I've ever eaten. So we have traveled about an hour from the market where we would eat this, and we are now in her Maya Casa, Casa Maya, which is a greenhouse where they are growing the green peppers that we saw at the market. And I'm actually there helping them harvest. And you're going to hear a sound of a clip, and it's actually the scissors cutting the pepper off its vine. Mm. <laughs> so we are stepping outside of the kitchen going to make a salad outside which is where we are going to enjoy our meal of tortillas and salad and some beans I love to cook and it's so incredible because the vegetables are just so fresh and you almost don't need to do much to them, right, when they're this fresh. And also, I wish you could see where I am. This beautiful rolling mountains. Behind me is this lush green forest, tall trees that I can almost not see where they end. And the sun is beautiful. In front of us is what they call Casa Maya, which is a greenhouse, and they're growing some peppers inside that. In the yard, there are kids around, there are families around. And we're about to have a feast that we are part of creating and making together as a community. And that's just really humbling for me. I think I found my next home, which could be Honduras. Now we eat together. Yeah. <laughs> 
Gracias, gracias, muchas gracias. Mi nombre es Gloria Danaisi Cruz López, soy la presidenta del grupo PMA aquí en la comunidad de Santa Cruz. This is Gloria Lopez. She is a community leader for farmers and helping them push forward with innovation and new techniques to improve their food production. Gloria, how worried are you about climate change and how has it impacted your community? El cambio climático, sinceramente, cuando llegó el programa, with all this climate change and, and primarily with hurricanes Eta and Iota that came last week, they lost all their crops. So this project came in the right time at the right moment because before they were only having their familiar plots and now they have their community plots, they have their water reservoirs and they also have their forest uh, nurseries that with these uh, forest nurseries, it helps them uh, prevent all the devastations that climate change uh, can have in their community. So this type of project has helped them for uh, making them more resilient in, in the community. Others in the community have been affected by climate change as well, such as Gabriel Gomez, a man in his 70s who has gone through so much, and yet he still has a smile across his face. He told me what happened to him. Nada era eso. Yo ya, ya estuve enfermo. He was very sick for around three years, and with the hurricanes, uh, he also lost his job, and uh, finally he also lost one of his sons, who was 30 years old. And so how concerned are you um, if there's going to be another drought or another uh, other floods? How is this going to impact his life? Eh, los deslizamientos siempre se dan. A mí lo que me climate change always come here, and he constantly have uh, floods here, yeah. and that uh, his crops are underwater. Uh, every time something like that happens, but he's very thankful to the program because with this program, with this type of program, he can uh, move forward. As always on Better Food, Better World, we end with a wish, and I have two very important wishes for Margarita and Iris. Margarita, she's in her 80s. The moment she walked into the greenhouse where we're cutting and harvesting green peppers, she immediately reminded me of my own gogo, my grandmother. Just the poise and the grace and the wisdom. And then she told me actually that her mom lived until she was 102. And she was quite concerned about not wanting to live that long. But I actually think it says so much about the quality of life and the food. It must be all those nutritious vegetables that they are growing and feeding themselves with. And she has a very important wish for her community. She wishes that for the community to continue recovering, everyone together and everybody working. She wishes that they can grow their crops, that they can sell them, and from the same income that they get from the selling of their product, that they can reinvest that money so they can continue growing. And also, she wishes that the community can educate all their children so they can continue going on with this project because she's going to go soon and she wants that the group stays formal because right now it's a very strength and formal group. And I'm sure you remember Iris, who has masterminded how to grow the best peppers in Central America. For she, it's, it has been a very big blessing. She's very thankful with God and with the project because her life has changed since 10 months from, from 10 months now. She had to travel before to Tegucigalpa. She had to leave her, her children here. 
era, es difícil, tan solo recordar eso. Uh, it's Acá even very difficult just to remember that. Pero have to leave their children and go. But since 10 months, now they, she has food for her children. She works on, on the local crops in the project. And it's a big blessing. And for, for her family and for her children. She is also asking for this project so it can be a long term project. That way they don't migrate to other places because they migrate because of lack of jobs here. They don't have a steady income. But with this help, with this project, it has been a very big blessing. And thank you to WFP. She's happy. She is with her children in her house. She doesn't have to go to work outside. And she's thanking God and us. So it is such an honor for me to be here today. Entonces es un gran honor para ella estar aquí. To hear your stories. Escuchar sus historias. To see your humanity. De ver toda la humanidad. And I feel at home. Y ella se siente como en casa aquí con ustedes. So thank you so much for sharing your stories with me. Así que muchas gracias por compartir sus historias con ella. You have an advocate in me. Tienen a alguien que va a hablar por ustedes en ella. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Así que muchas gracias. As an antenna optimist, I actually think that despite the challenges that the region is facing, Honduras has the potential to lead on solutions to address climate change. People in this country have already made a difference, and I think we can all learn from their accomplishments. Let's go back to Carlos, our food security expert. You've been working with your communities. How have you raised awareness of climate change? Awareness has been... Um improving a lot, but we need to do a, a massive education policies. Let know the people at the lowest level what is happening to the environment. We need to help them uh, know, learn what is going on with the environment that is not uh, only happening in Honduras. A lot of people here think that it's only happening locally and that it's not a global problem. What I saw is a community that is really figuring out and to some level really figured out how to live sustainably and how to have this symbiotic relationship with Earth and our planet. They are using the planet to grow their food, but at the same time giving back to the planet. And they are saying, you know, we need to do more, not only just in terms of their food, but also as part of their livelihood. They are selling those crops getting enough money to send their kids to school, buying things they don't grow themselves, and just really living a life full of dignity. And it's inspiring. I'm determined to take what I've learned here and you know, share it with as many communities as possible because, God, if we just have one more and two more and three more, just the, the ripple effect of that will be profound for our planet and our humanity. Thank you for listening and I look forward to hosting you the next time when we discuss food and war. The link between hunger and armed conflict is a vicious circle. War and conflict can cause food insecurity and hunger, just as hunger and food insecurity can cause conflict to flare up. My wish for Better Food, Better World is the idea that we all have to work together as a collective. And that means putting communities at the center of their development. It was just incredible seeing how much communities are doing for themselves as part of the resilience projects being supported by the World Food Program. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, and I hope you do, please do follow us using the hashtag 
better food, better world.